Okay, now we're on our last part for economics. Uh, we're just looking at regulation, economics of regulation. So there are types of regulation, different types of regulation. We first start with statutes. These are laws made by legislative bodies such as Congress. We have administrative regulators, uh, regulations, uh, basically rules issued by government agencies such as the Securities Exchange Commission that you know, govern things such as uh, investment advisors and so on and so forth. Uh, you have judicial law. Uh, basically, these are findings of courts that have, uh, these rulings of these courts that have precedent um, and interpretations of the law. So we have different types of regulators. Uh, they're divided up in government agencies, independent regulators, and outside bodies. So we start with the government agencies. These are like the Securities Exchange Commission directly from, uh, are actually part of the government. We have independent regulators uh, that are First subgroup is the self-regulatory organizations such as FINRA and the uh, National Association of Realtors. And these actually have, let's say, government, some sort of government uh, recognition. Then there are non-SROs, uh, which may include things such as the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board. Uh, and then we have also outside bodies that include things such as FASB or IASB that actually don't have, let's say, legal authority, uh, but for instance, FASB and IASB make both GAAP and IFRS. Looking at self-regulation in financial markets, SROs without government recognition are not regulators. While they are um, immune to political pressures, uh, they still may eventually have pressures from their members. Uh, this is also the reason why uh, it's more effective when they're properly supervised. So, uh, there also can be conflicts of interest between members of the SRO and the regulatory role of the SRO. We'll see that in a bit. And independent SROs are more common in common law countries such as the uh, United States and UK. Now, the need for regulation and intervention. So regulators are needed in the presence of, first off, informational frictions, meaning when information is not equally available or information asymmetry, meaning things such as like insider trading where uh, certain people know certain information is having those regulations to prevent things such as insider trading. We have uh, other things such as externalities. Uh, we're looking at consumption of public goods such as parks and defense uh, or, or defense where people enjoy these types of uh, uh, these public goods. So we need the regulations so that the cost is not born in a, uh, basically is born in a proportion to consumption. Looking at regulatory interdependencies, so we have regulatory capture theory. Basically, regulators end up being influenced uh, by those that are actually being regulated because it, a lot of times the, the people actually working at the regulator used to be former members of the industry. Uh, so they, it, it makes it more difficult for them to render impartial decisions. Uh, this has also been cited as one of the uh, concerns for, for commercialization of financial exchanges. We also have regulatory competition. So we have different exchanges, regulators in different jurisdictions compete for this business. So we may end up with what we call in the next bullet point, regulatory arbitrage, where business shop for these friendly regimes uh, or find loopholes. They go to one particular area or one particular country where they have more beneficial uh, where they have more lax regulations to, to fit what they're trying to do. Looking at some of the regulatory tools, the first one that we're going to look at are pricing mechanisms. What we're talking about here are essentially taxes. Uh, for instance, we could provide, uh, put taxes on, let's say, sin products such as alcohol and tobacco, or subsidies. We could give tax breaks to things such as uh, you know, green energy uh, type, type activities. We could also... Uh, there are restricting and requiring certain activities, restrictions on things such as like, you know, dangerous chemicals or requiring certain activities such as filing a 10K, right? Provisions of public goods or private projects. So perhaps, uh, you know, providing certain things for small business loans. Uh, now, the key here is, is that effectiveness of regulatory tools depends on the enforcement abilities of the regulator, meaning uh, can they... Uh, when they actually uh, enforce against, is it being effective? For instance, uh, there could be some challenges where the regulator actually finds the company. When they find the company, they're actually punishing the shareholders rather than management. So making sure that when they enforce, 
uh, they, they have the ability to force and they, they're, they're effective in doing so to, to achieve their particular objectives. Now, in regulating commerce, what's the purpose here? Uh, so the purpose of regulating commerce, you have uh, certain things such as company law, bankruptcy law, competition laws, and contract laws. And these are basically essential for business decision making, right? Example, for instance, investing in R&D when there is uh, intellectual property protection that, you know, I, I create this drug and, and I'm in a uh, regulatory regime where um, another company just can't completely just copy that drug. Uh, so having these intellectual property uh, protection then affects the decision on whether or not I want to pursue that particular research and development. And the regulatory framework, keep in mind, may, may help or may even hinder commerce. They could be, um, it could be very restrictive in, in, in commerce as well. So keep in mind, it, the, the door swings both ways in this case. So when we're looking at regulatory, uh, regulating uh, financial markets, uh, the whole purpose here is to promote uh, investor confidence. And so the idea is, uh, and they mostly focus on disclosure requirements to promote, uh, promote this investor confidence and trying to mitigate the agency problem that's inherent with financial intermediaries that basically act as agents. And how do we do that? We basically uh, you know, institute certain uh, regulations to, to assure certain things such as this fiduciary duty uh, for people such as financial advisors or brokers. And uh, protection for such as I, they really focus on protection for small investors, hence, you know, more lax uh, regulatory environment for larger investors that uh, invest in the hedge funds and, and any, and which only market to high net worth individuals uh, or uh, accredited investors. So you'll notice that a lot of, for instance, mutual funds, ETFs, those are all governed by uh, under the 40 Act, which uh, require diversification uh, and are heavily regulated and have to be, uh, you know, filed with the SEC. So the, the whole point here is when regulating financial markets, we're looking to protect the investment, promote confidence in the markets, uh, and enhance capital formation uh, within the financial markets. So focusing on regulating financial markets in, from a financial institution standpoint, like banks, investment banks, and so on and so forth, the key here is uh, prudential supervision, really looking at to prevent re uh, and reduce uh, system-wide risks, like not, not having a one institution fall and creating this contagion like Lehman Brothers. It basically um, making sure that these institutions aren't taking on risks, uh, excessive amounts of risks, and having a coherent policy globally where we're not having a regulatory arbitrage where firms are going to, to countries or areas where regulatory is more lax just to you know, be able to take on more risk this way to prevent this contagion effect uh, in, in a system-wide uh, issues that we potentially that we saw in 2008. So antitrust regulation, uh, what they're trying to avoid here is excessive concentration of market share or, or what we call anti-competitive behavior, uh, which may cause discriminative pricing um, or, or bundling or exclusive dealing. Uh, you know, we, we saw this in, in the United States in, in a lot of times where, where uh, you know, in cable companies recently that, that were uh, looking to, to merge. This basically, uh, having these types of antitrust regulations promotes uh, domestic competition and analysts often evaluate these announced mergers uh, like, like we saw in, in kind of cable uh, and, and telecom based on the probability of regula uh, regulators' response. Um, and keep in mind these types of uh, how their response is going to be kind of changes as regulatory regimes like may change uh, as one party gets elected versus another party. So the benefits and costs of regulation, looking at that, uh, so benefits are essentially easy to view, but very difficult to, to quantify. So regulatory, the regulatory burden, uh, there's a direct and indirect cost of regulation. So there's a direct cost, the actual implementation of the regulation, uh, and then the burden on the private sector. So uh, there's a net regulatory burden, which is the regulatory burden minus the private benefits of regulation, and that's compared to the cost of compliance of the actually regulated entity. Now, Keep in mind, these costs are easy to uh, assess ex post, meaning are, are easier to assess after the fact. And 
Uh, essentially, this is why uh, a lot of these uh, regulations may have what's called sunset clauses where they'd have to revisit it to renew the, that particular regulation. So in, eva in evaluating specific regulations, regulation can significantly impact valuation, right? We saw, uh, let's say, for instance, like for-profit institution, uh, for-profit universities basically found their valuations really impacted by what regulations on, uh, let's say, federal student loans. Um, you know, taxes typically shrink, uh, will shrink uh, an industry, uh, things such as like tobacco, while subsidies uh, can help it grow, uh, green energy, solar, wind power, those types of subsidies. And uh, the key here is a review to include the proposed regulations is critical because they can impact valuation so much. And the question is, is the regulation captive? If it's captive, then uh, there may see the benefits associated, uh, the intended benefits of that particular regulation. Now, there are different types of regulation that affect different types of industry. So, for instance, that environmental regulation may uh, very much impact things such as oil, gas, and mining. Uh, and then uh, even for, let's say, manufacturing, perhaps, uh, you know, your labor regulation affects those. And even today, things such as labor laws may uh, affect, you know, companies such as Uber uh, or, or Lyft where, you know, are they employees, are they contractors, or, or let's say regulation on real estate may affect uh, companies such as like Airbnb. So the keys here is the exam types of regulators and regulations. Uh, Self-regulation in financial markets, what are some of the, the issues there? Um, and, and you want to make sure that you look at you know, the economic ra rationale for regula uh, regulatory intervention. What, what, what's the whole purpose? Um, and then looking at regula regulatory interdependencies between uh, the regulator and, and, and those that are actually being regulated as well. And uh, some of the tools that they have, what's the cost benefit, taxes, subsidies, and making sure that you know the terminology. So this kind of uh, include, uh, concludes the, the economics portion. Uh, so before we kind of end on this, just wanted to kind of point out some things that as you kind of go through your study. Now keep in mind, uh, for, for level two being in, in vignette form, there's going to be still a lot, a lot of information. Um, so. Uh, I highly suggest that there's, of this, like for instance, this uh, study session that we went through here, there's a lot of memorization. I'm a big fan of flashcards. Uh, I think Schweizer also provides, uh, actually I know Schweizer provides flashcards that you can purchase. Uh, look, the, your goal is to try to get about, let's say, 60 to 70 percent of this stuff into long-term memory, and then you cram the last, you know, 30 to 40 percent in the last couple of weeks, and uh, how do you cram the last 30% just involves just a lot of coffee, five-hour energy, uh, Red Bull, prescription drugs. I don't care, a combination of all four. But the, how do you get things into long-term memory? I, I think flashcards are such a huge uh, thing that you can uh, kind of help your studying um, because the idea is that you, you can make your flashcards, you can uh, buy the ones at Schweizer, and you can take them everywhere you go. So if you're going out, you take it with you. Uh, you know, if you're going to the movies, you take it with you. If you're going to the bathroom, you take it with you. You'd be surprised how much study you can get when you're in the bathroom. So um, I do, I'm a big believer in flashcards, especially for these types of lessons. So uh, Definitely start to think about that as you're kind of early on in the study because there is a lot of stuff to memorize in level two. Uh, well, I'll see you guys uh, further down the line and uh, happy studying.